You cannot fight it alone. You cannot fight Ebola in silos. You have to work. You have to work together as a team. And doing that, that will get you to where you need to get. You know, sometimes when things happen, you think that oh, I'm just doing this little thing and it doesn't mean anything. But remember, to build a bridge, you have to first start with the first thing. And for everything that you do to have that connection. This is the only way the bridge will be connected to the other side. In the absence of that, you may think that it is very simple, but that simple thing makes a big difference. So as long as there are cases within the sub-region, we are still not free. And we're going to continue to retain the surveillance, we're going to continue to be vigilant until the entire sub-region is free. Dr. Francis Keta, Deputy M Minister of Health, and Chief Medical Officer for Liberia was recently here in British Columbia. He was here conducting a tour, sharing the story of Ebola, as well as extending appreciation for all the support that is being given from British Columbia as well as Canada on behalf of Liberia. We learned that 49 years ago, Francis was born under a tree in a small village. He wanted to become a doctor, but he had no financial resources. Through the support of a Methodist bishop, as well as a visiting surgeon from Los Angeles, his dream came true. And over the years, he was able to also acquire a master's degree in hospital administration, as well as homeland security and disaster preparedness. Years later, when the Ebola crisis hit Liberia, Francis was there on the front line, helping to lead the medical intervention for the people. So what you are going to hear today is him speaking at the University of British Columbia on the story of Ebola and community engagement. It's good to see you all. I think one of the most interesting things is that uh, it's good to see students. But Ebola does not only relate to students, it relates to all of us. So today I'm going to spend a few time just to pretend that you are in Africa. And you are in a country called Liberia. And then one morning, you get up and they say, Oh, there's a case of Ebola. And now you have to think, What do I do? What is Ebola? So basically, give you an overview of what it is. That is the map of Africa. And from the map of Africa, what I've done is that bringing you close and zooming you in into the three most affected countries that is Liberia, Guinea, and Sierra Leone. So in there you have Monrovia, you have Conakry, and you have Freetown. Those are the three major capital cities. But because I'm talking to you, let me give you the background of Liberia. What is Liberia? That is the country Liberia. And we follow the American system, so we have 15 counties. Out of the 15 counties, we have regions. We divide into regions from the health perspective. In terms of land mass, Liberia is 43,000 square miles. The last census that was done put Liberia about 3.6 million. So we are averaging between 3.6 million to 4 million. Depends on who you talk to, we'll tell you 4 million, and others will say 3.6. But we have health districts, there are about 88 health districts in the country called Liberia. And we have 136 administrative districts. I'm saying these things because it's very, very important on what happens. Why we have to deal with the disease the way we did? So, let me give you some information on the basic health indicators. So, if you look at Liberia, we are looking at 10,000 populations. So, Liberia, African region, the average is the global. So, for physicians, Liberia is 0.3 per 10,000. The African region, 2.6 per 10,000. The global is 14.1 physician to about 10,000 patients. And the data shows you the deficit that we have in Liberia. And remember, we are dealing with a public health disease. And if you see the deficit, the question is, what happens? How did this whole thing happen? How did you get to where you, you got? We talked about Guinea. Ebola started from Guinea in December of 2013. But there was nothing about it until March of 2014. We had the first case. But before then, in Guinea, they thought it was Lassa fever. Lassa fever is a hemorrhagic fever that mimics almost like Ebola. So the entire West African belt from, uh, from
from going from Liberia, from Lima County, all the way to Bon County to Lofa, going to Guinea and part of Sierra Leone, that is considered the Lassa fever belt. So most of the cases that come through from there will show the same signs and symptoms as Ebola. So when this first started, they thought it was the case of Ebola. So what happens? From Guinea, we had it spreading into Liberia and into Syria and further into Guinea. But one of the things that have helped us is the fact that Liberians are creative and they are also innovative. So when we first started talking about Ebola, you know, Ebola is like, don't touch. If you don't touch, you don't get it. And so that's the key. So we started to wash our hands. So if you go through checkpoints, you have this original, these buckets where you have to open the bar and then you wash your hands and so on. But many people did not have the funding to get those. So others had empty, empty containers. You put a, a nail. So if you look in there, you see a nail. If you put a nail up, through gravity, the water flows. So they used to have to wash their hands. Others could not afford the empty can. So what did they do? We have tribe, we have indigenous species, that's a bamboo or a reed. So you cut it, it's a hollow tree. You put a hole in it, and at the bottom you put a lid in. So when you pull the lid out, you see the, the, the pressure. So people wash their hands. But then there was one guy who was so innovative because this whole thing about Ebola is don't touch. So, but everything we do here, we have to touch because to remove the lid, you have to touch it. So what happened next? He had a container with a paddle. If you look down towards the floor, there's a paddle. So he steps on the paddle, and this container tilts itself, and the water flows. So basically, he is following the don't touch procedure. So he doesn't touch, he only steps, and he has a water flow. And the creativity led us to becoming zero. So what happens in March of 2014, the first case appeared in Liberia through a portion of like what called Lofa County by a town called Foyer. The picture over there is was the Minister of Health, then Dr. Walter Winnikari, who declared to the world that Liberia had a confirmed case of Ebola. But at that time, there were no labs in Liberia, so they had to send a specimen to Guinea in order to be confirmed that there was Ebola. But from that time, by June, by April, May, we were okay by June. We had someone living from the Syrian area into a place called New Kuta, which is a densely populated area. And there, because of the proximity and because of the nature of the crew people, and I'm, I'm a crew man, we love dead bodies. We love, I mean, this is when all the family gather together, they cry, they eat, they cry, they eat, go to sleep, and get up the next morning and cry and touch each other. And remember, Ebola is don't touch. If you don't touch, you don't get it. Ebola appearing in New Guta changed the culture of behavior. And that was a recipe for disaster. But after going through everything, on May 9th of this year, more than a year later, Ebola was declared free. This was during the declaration. This is Dr. Ellis Asasera, who is the delegation representative in Liberia. But some of the pictures here show what happened during Ebola in Liberia. And if you look there, that's the president of Liberia receiving the declaration from Dr. Walter Bonigale that Ebola, Liberia was declared Ebola free. But this is something important. Remember, you saw the statistics regarding the amount of healthcare workers in the country, the ratio, and so forth. Look what happened. We lost 3,000, we lost, uh, we had confirmed cases of 3,150 through laboratory. We lost 4,785 persons from Ebola. But what is important is that 378 healthcare workers were infected and 192 died. Remember the ratio and seeing what is happening. So, how did we get to zero? Getting to zero is the fundamentals of what we do in public health. Whenever there is a disaster, every disaster begins in the community and it ends in the community. So in order to get rid of that disaster, you have to get the community involved. Community engagement, 
community education, community mobilization, all of those things play a key role in getting rid of any public health disaster. If the community is not involved, if you think you have all of the, the brilliant idea, if you think you have all of the strategies, and you isolate the community from it, you get nowhere. So the key to fighting any disaster is community engagement. You have to educate them, you have to get them on board, you have to do that. And what does it take? Meeting those people in the community, going there. But you, you cannot be an outsider to do that. What do you do? You work with people within those communities. Because in that community, they know who is who. You don't know. Let me give you an example. We had an outbreak in a place called Kibba, a town called Jinewande. And we thought we were doing everything. Every time we went there, they tell us, oh, everything is okay. And when we leave, two or three persons die. And every time we went there, they tell us, oh, everything is okay. Sometimes the chief comes up and says, look, go and check the houses. We don't have anyone that is sick here. And because we did not live in there, we didn't know. So what happened was that the chief daughter had cerebral malaria and started conversing and they her tongue. And all of them were sitting there looking at her. She bit her tongue, there was blood. So Ebola, blood. They saw blood coming, they said, oh, we think she has the thing that people keep talking about. So everybody wanted to give their blessings. Went to the clinic and said, look, your patient is over there. So the staff came in, wrote their PPEs, took her in, got a blood specimen. When they checked the blood, did it. She was Ebola negative or malaria positive. So she was treated, and after she got the treatment, she went back to the village. That changed the entire village. Then they told us the story that every time we went there, the house the chief was standing in front of, the house by his bike, the where they had all the sick people. So whenever he's telling us, go and check the, the houses, all the sick people are in the house right behind him. And so, it takes the community involvement to make sure that you can get rid of anything. So you have to engage the community and so forth. When Ebola first broke out, the president of Liberia, Ellen Johnson Sully, decided to hear the task force. And that was a risk that she took. Because as a leader, you need to designate someone so that when there's a problem, you can blame the person. But she decided to take up that role. And perhaps, her leadership, the ability of coming forth and saying, look, I'm the head of the country, my people are dying, I'm going to make sure that we get rid of this and so forth. Though she did not have the background to do that, but because she put herself forth, all of us have to step forward because we don't want to see our president being disgraced. So we have to do everything it took to make sure that we are rid of the border. So it took that leadership, consistent meetings, and the incident management system, and based on the incident management system, that takes into consideration the coordination, communication, command structure, and so forth. Mm -hmm. So we have the PACE. The PACE is the Presidential Advisory Committee on Ebola. So that was chaired by the president. And front of that, you will see the president at one of the PACE meeting. Then you have the incident management system. You have the chairperson who was covering this one. And my role was Deputy Incident Manager over Medical Response and Planning. And under me, I had a cadet of strong and proactive individuals. So we had it. someone in charge of laboratory, episodes, social mobilization, contact tracing, case management, psychosocial community, and their body management. On the other side, we had support, and on the support, we had logistics, operation, finance, monetary evaluation, and planning. So, it took a team effort to do this, but it took a lot of rudimentary process to make sure that we had things done, you know, trying to graph things on the board and so forth. But this is what happened. The first case. After the first case in March, we were zero. Then in June, we had another case. And what happened? We started having problems. So, from one case, boom, it zoomed up. And I'll show you why it happened. Because remember, 
Ebola is, if you don't touch, you don't. So we fought very hard to bring it down. And this was, it was easy. It took into consideration certain strategies that we used that I'm going to discuss, and you will see that. But then we went to zero. We went to zero. Maintaining zero was a problem. But finally, just before getting to zero, we have isolated a community, a place called St. Paul River Bridge. We knew our house, the houses were mapped out, we knew where we thought we could get another case. And boom, one of the cases we anticipated was a 15-year-old female. And she was informed, stay home, please, when you begin to have fever, if you have elevation in fever, if you have if you have a muscle pain, you have a diarrhea and so forth, please call us. No. She got sick and ran away at night. What did she do? By running away, she got in contact with people. And what happens? We went from that Ines case to a first generation, a second generation, a third generation. And what happens? All those in the black died. These are patients, these are people that died. Had she just gone over and come to us, we would have saved all of these lives. And so sometimes it's one thing giving people the flexibility to do things, and sometimes you have to think outside of the box to restrict the movement of people when it comes to what is going to, to affect the public. So we're not able to save enough life, we lost that. Then we went almost 29 days in a country without a single case. And then one day, I got an alert that we think there's a probable case. Take the person, that person was tested, and boom. It was on March 20, we had a 44 year old female who came down with Ebola after 29 days. Remember the cycle is 21 days. We've gone 29 days. So basically, there was no active case within the country. But how did this woman come down with that? You have to think outside the box. Did you travel out of Liberia? Did you have anyone coming to visit you? And those answers were no. So what is it? Remember, when you are a survivor, it takes about 82 days for the virus to be within the semen. Female is about 40, 43 days. So during those three months, you tell them abstinence or use condom. So the next thing that came to me is that, is this something through sexual contact? And we did an investigation, yes. We had a person, and what happened next? This person left the Ebola treatment unit for 175 days. So that changed everything we've learned regarding Ebola. And so we had to get a spam from him, and the spam was positive for Ebola. So the, the protocol and everything has changed. A couple of things that, is, that help us. This is the process of bearing. Initially, we were taking, you have to be safe barrier, you have to protect those that are going to bury have to protect themselves and so forth. We did not have enough burial teams to take care of the amount of burials we had. So the person had to do something outside the bus that is not a, a cultural practice in Liberia. That is cremation. So here we had a crematory where we begin to burn to cremate bodies in order to stop the spread of the disease. Because the disease becomes more virulent when a person dies because of the starvation of oxygen. So every, all of the virus wants to come over to the surface and find another host. You know, virus is like human being. Everyone trying to survive. So if your host is dying, what do you do? You have to find someone else so that you can continue to live. And so this is what the virus was doing. So basically, from that case, the 44 year old female the NHO had to change the criteria. So now, a male survivor had to, after three months, they have to have, the vaccine have to be tested twice after three months. And 
If it is negative twice, then of course they are okay. If they are not, I have to continue until they are negative. And so, we have to do a lot of things to change the protocol and so forth. This was one of the first strategies that we developed. And this strategy is called the CCC strategy, Community Care Centers. You know, when you have a disease from the community, the first thing you have to do is to ask the person. Because they did touch someone else, that person get infected. So the community care center strategy was how can you quickly isolate that person, put them in an area, and then get a blood specimen from them, have it tested, and if it comes positive, you can take them over to the ETU, and at the ETU, because at that time they did not have enough bed. So at the ETU, you have three categories. You have suspected case, probable case, then confirmed case. So if you can have the community care centers closer within the community, then at the ETU you will only have confirmed cases. So those cases that are going to go there will only be confirmed cases to, to open up more bed capacity. And so this is the first strategy. And this strategy worked and helped us. But Sierra Leone used it the most. Then the second strategy was designed. This strategy is called Rapid Isolation and Treatment of Ebola, which is the right strategy. What is the right strategy? The right, the right strategy was very simple. It was a strategy developed based on what happens in bigger like fire, fire disaster when you have all the fire and you have all the helicopters, all the big fire tanks going in and trying to pull it off. And when you pour so much water and pull it off, what happens? You have people that go with the smaller canister, that go with the smaller canister and pour out the smaller fires. So the rapid response team was saying, no, they were trained to go into those areas that were not accessible by road. If there was a road of death in a particular community, the rapid response team go there immediately, try to get one of the contacts, isolate them, those that are sick, that have some signs and symptoms, get a specimen, send it over, if you get a result and if it is positive, definitely we begin immediate treatment. And so, to do that, we have to empower it from the county level. So the foundation for the rapid response team was preparing people at the local level from the county level so that they can effectively and efficiently go forth to pull out whatever it is. But you also have to do pre-position of supplies. So there should be supplies there that they can get immediately to go to those areas. And so that was the strategy that was designed. And this strategy was designed in Liberia. And so, these are some of the things that gave us the zero in Liberia. So now, can, you can see that Liberia has gone more than three cycles uh, in terms of being blood free. And uh, Liberia is free, Sierra Leone and Guinea still have a problem. But the problem is more towards uh, Conakry. Conakry is the capital of Guinea, Freetown is the capital of Sierra Leone. So along that border, they're where the problem is. So the border towards us is fairly good. So basically, we are, you know, we are on the edge, but we are little, we are cautiously optimistic, you know. And so this follows most of the things that we did. Uh, in order to get Ebola, I have to sit down on a daily basis, back out. Members of the surveillance team, I take case search, going into the community and finding where the single case is, making the contacts and so forth. These were some pictures of the ETUs that we had, the treatment units, and they were very costly to construct them and so forth. But the one with the Liberian and the American flag was built by the US military. And this was purposely for healthcare workers. So to encourage healthcare workers and give them the confidence that just in case during a fight, if you get infected, there is a place that you can go and get a good care. So with that, that helped most of the healthcare workers to go out there and fight to the teeth to make sure that Liberia gets to zero. And so all of those things play a major, major role. Smaller laboratories and people being trained to build a capacity for quick testing. And with that quick testing, you can begin to take the necessary action and prevent the wide spread. And took into consideration funding. People that serve as case finder, the investigators and so forth, they need some little thing in order to move on their barrier teams, they need some, they have to be incentivized. And so, donors funding, the WHO, uh, the World Bank, all of those people play a major role in making sure that 
those people who are satisfied to some degree so that as they go into the field, they can do their job. But for us to maintain zero in Liberia, so what is the strategy? The main thing is infection prevention and control. That is something that is very important. Simple hand washing is very key. And how do you quickly isolate someone? What are the cardinal signs that you have to look at whenever a patient comes over? What are some of the questions you ask them? How do you wear your gloves before you touch a patient? You can't just go in bed using bare hands to touch a patient, especially when we are in a malaria endemic area. So it's very, very important. So all of those things are important. Another key is deepening the community engagement. Now we have to work with them at that, that level, at our borders. Because in Liberia, you may have your house in Liberia and your kitchen is in Guinea or Africa. There's not much value. So, what do you do? You have to educate those people that look, if you, uh, if you have fever and so forth, this is what you do. And if you do that, it's going to save everyone. So with all of those things, being vigilant and so forth is the process we're going to take to get to zero. Another portion is the cross borders, those main cross border areas. How do we strengthen them? How do we build a triage along those borders so that when people come in, the temperature is intense. When I came in yesterday, I had to go through a semi triage. You know, I was asked a couple questions, and then after that, my temperature was taken to make sure that I didn't have fever and so forth. And that's the same system. It is good. And I talked to the public health officer yesterday, and she said, Well, oh, you know, Please, we have to say, no, 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 you don't have to worry. Go ahead, ask me any question you want to ask me because it's important. It is very, very important. So be free and ask me whatever question you want to ask me. You know, and so this is it. And uh, I was getting a thermometer this morning. I took my temperature, it was 97.2. And I reported it this morning. This evening when I get home, I'm going to take my temperature and report it. You know, so it's very, very important. So those are things that we do in Liberia in order to keep our country safe. During the beginning of the entire thing, Liberia is a, it's a poor country. We do not have you know, electricity many times and so forth. So there were times we had to work in the darkness in order to gather all the information we needed and so forth. It took people from different countries. So you have a US general, General Volosky. You have Professor Hans Rosler from Sweden and then General He from China. All of them working together. I mean, this shows how we partner together. Because what Ebola has shown us is that you cannot fight it alone. You cannot fight Ebola in silos. You have to work, you have to work together as a team. And doing that, that will get you to where you need to get. As I indicated at a peace meeting, every Friday we have peace meeting. This is the president of Liberia sitting right here. And we are informing her on what is going on in the country in terms of Ebola, how many cases we have, what are we doing, what is the new strategy that we developed in order to make sure that we get to zero. So all of these things were very, very important to get us to zero. It took so many people. It took the president, it took the international community, it took a lot of people working together. It took uh, the Carnival Neuro Foundation sending us supplies from uh, Vancouver and so forth, and a lot of people contributing. Down Foundation, everybody working together as a team. You know, sometimes when things happen, you think that, oh, I'm just doing this little thing and it doesn't mean anything. But remember, to build a bridge, you have to first start with the first thing. And for everything that you do to have that connection, this is the only way the bridge will be connected to the other side. In the absence of that, you may think that it's very simple, but that simple thing makes a big difference. And so all those little supplies, all those little things have made a significant impact in what we did in Liberia. So, Dr. Moses Masakwa was in charge. He was one of those working within the thematic area. Remember, I showed you case management. So he was the head of case management. Under him, he had the ETUs and he also had the dead body management. So Dr. Moses Masakwa and I had to travel around the country many a time to make sure that whatever we were developing in terms of strategy and so forth, those things were effective. And yes, indeed, they were effective. But we can come back to you and tell you that it is not over until it is over. What do I mean? We still have 
people, and I will never not necessarily in the beginning, why does they have some cases? So as long as there are cases within the sub-region, we are still not free. And we're going to continue to maintain the surveillance, we're going to continue to be vigilant until the entire sub-region is free. Thank you so much. As a result of the plea from Liberia for support in their healthcare system, Croy Brunel Science Foundation has committed to sending over 1,000 hospital beds along with medical supplies and support. We have now shipped nine containers over and we have 11 more to go once we have the funding in to send that shipment. Each container costs approximately $7,500 and we can pack around 50 beds on board each of those containers. We do need your support to help us to continue to support Francis and his country in rebuilding their healthcare system. Now for questions and answers. My name is Francis Edgar, I'm from Canada. So uh, I'm just curious, you talked about the support that uh, Liberia received, especially from the U.S. and uh, you mentioned that Cuba. I just want to know what support did Liberia receive from the sub-region, ECOWAS and the other African countries um, who end up dealing with Ebola, um, especially Nigeria, since that's our powerhouse and they dealt with it uh, very well. Thank you so much. Definitely, like I indicated, you cannot fight Ebola in silos. The entire world came to our aid, but Africa played a major role. Uh, AU established a tax force that came over and brought in epidemiologists from Nigeria, from Ghana, from Kenya, from Uganda, and other places that came over. So those epidemiologists work with our active case farmers and so forth. Another thing again, you talk about Nigeria as our big brother. Nigeria was the first country that gave us the first five million dollars to begin a payment of our healthcare workers and so forth. So there were a lot of efforts from within Africa and out of Africa that helped us to get to where we are. Hi, I'm Allison. Um, I'm an undergrad right now. Um, my question is, in your opinion, what would you have changed about Liberia's response to Ebola? That is an excellent question. There are a couple of things that have to be changed. The first thing is that we thought we had a good healthcare system. And the healthcare system starts from the primary level. So the clinic and so forth. What we realized from Ebola is the fact that our healthcare system was not strong enough. There were a lot of gaps that were in the system. And had we seen those gaps, those gaps would have put a stop to the second case that came. We didn't know that. Infection prevention and control <clears throat> was a major problem. Uh, people took for granted a lot of things, and they did it. Another thing that we did not realize is the strength of the community. Had the nation got the community involved from day one, that would have changed what happened later on. So that was an issue. The third portion was in terms of the response. It took a long time for the international community to respond to what was going on in Liberia. It is sad to say that it took um, a U.S. citizen to get infected when this drew the war you know, concern. So I mean, so what needs to be changed is that we are not in a global community. Whatever happens in one country, within a few hours, we can fly from whatever to another country. So we should not look at the world as divided. We should look at the world as a unit. And together, if we work as a team together, definitely we can change a lot of things. And last but not least is that even when, it's, when the support came, the support came with contracts. Those contracts were not flexible. So whenever there is a disaster, a disaster does not mean contracts. Disaster takes flexibility because as whatever comes, you have to change your strategy in order to get to where you want the end result. And those strategies may take different forms and shape. So if you have a contract 
that a strip jacket, then of course it limits the effectiveness and the efficiency in the response to address what is going on. So those are some of the things that we've seen, and these are some of the things we hope that the world can learn from it. Thank you very much. My name is Michael Eisen, and I have sort of two questions for you. I was going to ask you about best practices, sort of the flip side to your question. But you raised the issue of community involvement, something you didn't expect to be so strong. And uh, I hope to God you never have to face this again. Like, congratulations to you and your team for, for addressing it so strongly. But how would you involve community again? Because that, I think you're right, it's a very, very powerful tool if used correctly. Thank you so much. With what has happened now, we have built the confidence of the community. What we're trying to do now is to harness that relationship with the community. You know, the biggest problem in the Gage community is a trust factor. If the community doesn't trust you, you can tell them the best story. Let me give you an example. I used to live in Chicago. The south side of Chicago, there was someone who decided to build, to build a swimming pool and felt that all of the African American women, you know, they were not exercising and so forth, so they needed to build a swimming pool for them to swim and so forth. I mean, and this was a fabulous idea. But what happened was that they did not talk to the people. And after they built the swimming pool, six months later they came back and not many people were using the pool. Why? Because no African American female would take four hours to fix her hair and go jump into the pool to want to take that. You know? And simple as that. Let me give you another example. In my period, there was a philanthropist who came over and felt that the people were using uh, the bushes to defecate. So they started to build uh, toilets. But then what they did was that they didn't ask a question. They built the toilets and put red roof over the toilet. Now in the village, people were afraid of red. They thought that if you wear red, it served as an attractive to lightning. So, a couple of months later, they came and we used the toilet. And what happened? They had, it, they had a notion that, God, this people want to kill us. When we go in there, right in there, a light will come and hit, you know, hit the roof, and we'll be killed, you know. And so they did that. And so I'm saying this to me that engaging the community means you have to sometimes bring out somebody. That person may not be the leader, quote unquote, political leader of that community. But you have some of those people who you may consider nothing, but those are the key makers in the community. For example, you may have a chief, and this chief may be so powerful, but this chief is powerful because of what? Because he has a wife, and our wife is the only person that can convince him. So what do you do? You want to get something done, you bring this woman. You know, many times, as men, we are proud and say, oh, the Bible said the man is the head of their home. That's good. That's what the Bible says. But there's something that the Bible says that we do, we do not listen to. That's the silent portion. Yes, the men are the head of the home, but the women are the neck. So wherever the neck turns, the head turns it. And, and so this is something that we have to realize. Sometimes you have to use those little things in order to get where you want to get. And when you get that, don't let it go. Hold on to it. Maximize whatever you can in order to build better responses. And this is what I'm trying to do. Just a question about uh, trust in healthcare personnel. I mean, we heard in the West certainly about places where people were not only mistrustful of particularly Western healthcare personnel helping with the Ebola crisis, but that they actually felt that they were causing the deaths. Um, given Liberia having such a uh, low ratio of domestic healthcare workers to population. Was that a greater or lesser problem in, in Liberia? And um, do you feel now that, that in, in some ways maybe is it possible that as a result of the crisis that there is more confidence because Liberia has been declared Ebola free while the neighboring countries haven't? There, has, there was always a mistrust. There were a lot of myths that were surrounding Ebola. One of them were the fact that 
people were using Ebola to harvest organs from others. You know, and so there's this distrust among health workers, you know, community against health workers. But like I indicated regarding the situation with the chief and his daughter, those little things change the perception. Uh, in other places where so many persons died in a family, I've gone to a, to a place where I only saw the only person that survived from a family of seven was a three-year-old child. And when I got into this house, I saw this little boy, you know, sitting there, you know. And so, those within the community see such a thing happening. So if you can get people out quickly and take them to the ETU, and these people can come back as survivors. So they come back in that sense, a more positive message that no, this is not it. We do not go there and our organs are not taken away. But the sooner you get into, into treatment, the better it is for you. And so using those messages, using those survivors to come on the radio and talk about things and so forth, their experiences within the ETU have to change the perception, try to build that trust that we're lacking in the initiation uh, of, the, of the, the crisis. So it took a lot of work. It took so much patience, and it took sometimes a lot of death within the community for the community to realize that what we are saying, we are wrong, we think we are doing the right thing, and we need to follow through. It was, I think, almost exactly a year ago that Dr. Flynn ordered to declare the out of control in the region, towards the end of June. And then it was, took until, if I remember, around the time of the General Assembly meeting, before the international community started to make pledges. And then it was months after that before the pledges came through. Do you think that the WHO report that has come out uh, recently addresses the gaps that existed in the international community? Definitely, like uh, the international community was a little slow. I think everyone was caught on a way. I think people did not know what this would have turned to. For example, all from 1976, when Ebola first broke out in Zaire, it always happened in a remote area. So, within those remote areas, definitely they just come up and few persons die, and that's it. You know, and who knows? Now that we are finding other things, maybe this has led to the reoccurrence a couple of years later and so forth. But so I think what the international community thinking about was that, okay, this is another Ebola, and maybe it may go away. But like, which I don't know what you were here when I show that link, but what happens, and so forth, that shows a different perspective of what this virus, this virus could do, and the potential of this virus going worldwide. The fact that there was someone that left from Liberia that went to Nigeria, and there was a cascade of events in Nigeria. The fact that there was someone from Liberia that came to the United States, and there was a cascade of events in the United States, that turned some of the comments around. I think it's a lesson learned for every one of us. The international community now is looking at setting aside some funding, so that just in case, if anything of such will happen, at least there will be an initial initial capital that can go forth in order to contain that. I think there was no money sitting somewhere for Ebola. You know that, okay, if there's Ebola, we're going to get money from there and buy these things and send them. No. So I think the WHO report and so forth, I mean, give and take, there are a lot of things about it, but we just have to see how it plays out. But we're hoping that we do not, and I tell people, I'm not going to which Ebola on a worst enemy. It's nothing that anyone wants to experience. Thank you very much. Um, my area of particular interest is health and health workers. And so I, I wanted to ask you whether uh, you think that your current situation now in Liberia is such that healthcare workers are adequately trained in uh, infection prevention and control and have the adequate uh, supplies that they need, or would you say that there's still a gap? Uh, in terms of 
the total amount of manpower, yes, we have adequate, we do not have adequate manpower, but in terms of training, Liberian healthcare workers are some of the best trained uh, Ebola specialists now in the world. Uh, because even with the international community going in, those that went in had to go through training. We established our own training, headed by my friend here, Dr. Moses Massacre, uh, training them how to to dove and do downing of PPEs and so forth. So we have an entire school of healthcare workers around the country that are trained, that have worked in the ETU, have, have worked both in the cold and hot, we call them cold, cold zone and hot zone and so forth. So the experience is there. In terms of supplies, yes, there were supplies sent and those supplies, there are supplies stay in the country that we can use. So just in case, if we were to have any case, I'm not saying that I cannot have a case, but if we were to have any case, we have the ability to stop it immediately. And if many people will die, it will not take more than five persons that will die because we have the capability to do that now. I was just wondering, what made Liberia different? And how come the thing wasn't achieved in the early There was a couple of things that happened. But as I said and reflect, on what did we do right that was not done? You know, when Ebola started, in Sierra Leone, they have a military general who is the head of the response there. In Guinea, they also have a military who is in charge of that. We, you are all public health students. You cannot use a military tactics to fight a public health disease. That's a recipe of disaster, for disaster for kids. And so that's what happened. When Ebola started in Liberia, in August, what did we do? I put the same mistake. We decided to use military means to fight Ebola. So we had people quarantined in a place called West Point. And we had people quarantined in a place called Dolosa. And we had the military surrounding the, the towns. But in Liberia, people are just hustling. Nobody keep two, three days of food in their homes. So after a few hours, people are hungry. And what happened? A hungry man is an angry man. So the people decided to go and find food. And the military said, no, you cannot leave. And so that ended into a chaos where a gunfire broke out, someone got killed. And so everybody looked at the government and said, wow, you are killing your own people. And based on that, People say, hmm, we think we need to change our strategy. So instead of using military means to fight a public health disease, we decided to use what should have been done, what I did earlier on in the area that I control called Tapita. Because early in March, we started with community engagement. We started talking to the community and so forth. And so the entire Ebola crisis, with the 25,000 persons that live in the district, we did not have a single case from that district. We've had one or two persons coming in, but because we had the only isolation unit within the areas who kept them in our isolation unit, but we did not have a case because the community took ownership. And because they took ownership, they were able to send a message to their relatives that look, when you are sick, don't come to the village. If you come here, we cannot take you into our homes. So you stay there until whatever is going on is over before you come. So using the community engagement model was what we did best. So we left from military strategy to using public health strategy and involving the community in order to do the job for us. And I think this is the difference. Thank you very much. Just I'm interested about things as we're progressing forward now, there's two things I'm interested in. Um, do you think there's been any progress in, we hear about stigma for the community health workers and, and the workers that perhaps are not being able to get jobs and so on going forward? Has there been any progress on that, perhaps community engagement is helping there? And also, could you tell me a little bit about if anything's happening with the post Ebola post syndrome with the Ministry of Health, are they looking at that? Thank you so much. So, yes, indeed, we still have stigma in Liberia, especially for survivors, you know. And uh, so this is something that we are dealing with. 
we have a psychosocial team that is working with them. We organize the survivor into a national network uh, so that we can work along with them and help them with some of the situation, some of the problems that they have and so forth and deal with that. So stigma is something that is just hard to get away from. Then worse of it, after we had the last case that was transmitted by a survivor and so forth, that brought a major, major problem. You know, so we are still trying to deal with that. So from the Ministry of Health perspective and from the international community, there are a couple of studies that are going on in Liberia. Uh, for example, we have a vaccine study that phase two study that went on in Liberia and using one of the vaccines that was that is part of the study was designed here in Canada by the public health service and one from the United States. So we have RSV and CHAP3 and then using a placebo. So that's the initial uh, phase two study was for 600 persons, but because of the success in after vaccinating the first 600, they estimate to 1,500. And I and my colleague called Dr. Stephen Kennedy, Dr. Kennedy is the head of that vaccine study in Liberia. Both of us were the first two that took the vaccine. And I can tell you, I didn't take the placebo. I know exactly what I took, but I can't see. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, basically, we go for testing, and they realize that, yes, our body is building antibody, you know. So our title is increasing and so forth, so there is some, you know, potential in that. So that is something we've done. Also, with the fact that we are having a lot of sickly from Ebola, you know, there are a lot of diseases that are coming, people are becoming blind, uh, severe muscle pain, uh, back problem, gait, and so forth. There is a study that is being uh, started by CDC and NIH over a long-term study on survivors and see, with even going further, in some of them, there are two cases where survivors that have gotten pregnant, they had preterm labor and these, and these, these uh, fetus died. And when they tested them, they were Ebola positive. So there are a lot of things that we didn't know before that we are going to learn now. So the, it's a virgin area. And what it's going to take is, it's going to take patience, it's going to take everybody working together and making sure that the best thing is done for the world. I have a question. Uh, I'm uh, concerned about the uh, practice of washing the body and burial. Uh, will the government take a, uh, Will the government try to eliminate that progress, that process now, or will the government allow it to start up again? As it stands now, we still have a moratorium over washing their body, even for those areas that we can reach easily when anyone dies, be it natural cause and so forth, we do a swap, a must swap. And with the must swap, we can determine whether that person died from Ebola or not. So that is something that the government is pushing. We push safe barrier. And so, dead body wide, baby the bodies and so forth, it is a low blow in Liberia now. You know? And uh, we're hoping to continue that. We think uh, our brothers and sisters, the Muslim, the religious faith and so forth, they understand um, what the effect has been, the negative impact it has had within their communities and so forth. So I think everyone is about on board in order to make sure that we continue the best practices. Well then I'd like to thank Dr. Kitty on behalf of uh, UBC and all of us for a very interesting uh, talk and for answering all of our questions. Thank you.